since entering Lost Lake for us is kind of forbidden. Deacon makes a little stop far out from Lost Lake and plans to enter the camp in order to steal some antibiotics for Boozer. Eventually we reach Iron Mike himself, walking with Schizo, who you can consider a left hand of Iron Mike. Reaching the local infirmary, Deacon grabs the cooler but gets busted by Ricky and Addy. Addy is a local doctor and pretty much the only doctor between the three camps, which is another reason why Deacon decided to raid Lost Lake. Deacon has no other option but to explain that Boozer got blood poisoning and needs medical attention. Even though Ricky says that there is no way, Addy insists into helping Boozer because as a doctor she has to treat everyone equally, and also they're a lesbian couple. Ricky takes Deacon to pick up Boozer, where Deacon uses an opportunity to ask her about Lisa. And turns out Lisa was sent with another three men by Schizo for a supply run and she separated from the group. At this point, let her be, cause there's no way you lose her twice. We reach Boozer who is having an episode again, but thankfully Ricky snaps him out of the hallucination and we head back to the camp. In the morning, Addy says that we first need to bring some antibiotics and that Boozer has a slim chance of survival. Having another wonderful walk, we get to meet the man himself, Iron Mike. Schizo is trying his best to prepare Iron Mike to completely ignore anything that Deacon has to say, while Ricky is trying to convince him otherwise. Deacon doesn't really like that, so they start a fight which is interrupted by Iron Mike who makes a very good point and develops a character for himself throughout the story. Mike, Deacon was I one know. that brought me the good- I know, and I know what kind of man he is, what he's done. He done any worse than you? Ricky, how about me? We've all been out in this shit, Schizo. We've all done things we're not proud of. Iron Mike is a very chill and reasonable person. Even though both him and Deacon have a shitty past, he's ready to forgive Deacon because of his recent actions like bringing Lisa to Lost Lake instead of Hot Springs and risking his life to get Boozer some medicine. After even more walking we get to freely explore the camp. The camp itself is much more civilized than anything we have seen before. Lost Lake looks way better than Copeland and Hot Springs camp combined, having more livable houses for people, appearing more of a village rather than a camp. And the shops also provide much better better equipment, especially bike parts. This is where bike riding becomes much more enjoyable. Although it's also expensive than anywhere else, so you will have to grind some side missions and bounties to start upgrading. Coming back to the infirmary, Deacon asks if he can do something for the camp, to which Addy replies with a request to bring her a Lista knife, an instrument used for field operations during the war. The knife so happens to be in Sherman's camp, which Deacon says is crawling with freakers, but we don't really have a choice. While going towards Sherman's camp, we finally get a callback from Mr. O'Brien himself, who tells us that while he is looking for information on Sarah, Deacon has to help him out. Picking up the list and knife and bringing it back to Addy, we drive back to O'Brien, who absolutely has zero information on Sarah as he is still working on it. To summarize O'Brien's missions, higher ups at Nero are running a lot of their own field operations that neither O'Brien or people in lower rank know about. Deacon's job would be to pull up to their LZs and listen for the information that the researchers are recording on their recorder. Basically, what we did six hours ago in the first Nero LZ. Before that though, we have to put a tracker on their main helicopter in order for developers to explain how we know the exact location of the Nero choppers. On that same LZ, we learned that Nero started noticing some freakers are being affected by some sort of mutation. This one in particular that they have on the table is called Bleacher, and they're physically stronger and more durable than regular freaks. This won't affect us in any way because all the freakers they are studying attack us pretty much every day. After our conversation with O'Brien, game sends us to the rogue camp where Lisa ran away from Schizo's supply run group. But I did a pretty big mistake and pulled up to the place at night and let me tell you, nights and days gone are not that sweet. Right off the bat I have noticed a horde in the distance while already being attacked by another group of freaks. Technically, no flex intended, I could take it down in exchange for all my utilities and ammo but I decided to avoid it and drove off to the nearest bunker to skip the night. Deacon's survival vision brought us inside a house where Lisa left a note saying I want to forget. After learning absolutely nothing about Lisa, we return back to Lost Lake. In the infirmary, Addy tells us that Boozer is getting worse, the antibiotics are not enough anymore and all they can do is wait, keeping an eye on his state. Deacon is desperately trying to come up with something, not wanting to go through another loss again, but Addy tells him that there is nothing he can do right now and kicks him out. Outside, you can see how completely broken he is, while his only closest relative is slowly getting worse and for the first time in his life and in the game, Deacon is absolutely absolutely powerless on the current event, and he might lose someone close to him for real this time. 
Ah, Skizzle. Skizzle somehow sniffed out the current problem and tells Deacon that he has info on a plane crash sent by a drug company that has a package full of antibiotics. But there's a catch. The plane crash area is controlled by rippers and turns out Iron Mike has a peace treaty with their leader, meaning that there is no way Lost Lake can get access to the drugs. Technically, Deacon is a drifter, meaning that even if he raids the plane, it shouldn't affect the peace treaty. Uh, at least on paper, but again. Lost Lake are the only ones who have that information, which means that rippers can sniff out that Deacon got the info from them, and then it becomes our problem. Either way, Deacon has no choice because Boozer is slowly dying, so he agrees with Schizo. Leaving the camp, Schizo contacts us again, saying the top secret heist mission will take some time, and reminding us again that he's sticking his neck out just for us. Schizo's motivation for doing this is confusing. The impression we get from him is that he hates rippers, he won't follow what Iron Mike says, and he's ready to go against Iron Mike orders to get what he wants. At the same time, he doesn't like Deacon at all, so either he's generally trying to help or get Deacon out of the camp by getting him in trouble. Pretty much instantly, we get a callback from Schizo saying that everything is ready. Deacon drives to the border separating Rippers and Lost Lake, which is supposed to be guarded by the guards, but thanks to Schizo, who is the head of security in the camp, he sent all of them away from duty. Fighting through the small Ripper outpost, Holy shit, is that an LMG? We finally reach the plane crash area where we see a cutscene showing us a huge bolt freak ripping a bleacher apart. And you already know what that oh. means. This monster is called Breaker and it is a little bit difficult compared to the bear as this result of oral steroid consumption sprints at you once it sees you. The best strategy is to use your utilities and shoot exploding crates at the right time in order to deal significant damage. Once Bolt Sam Sulik dies off, we grab the medicine, which looks more like an Uber Eats from Chernobyl, and drive back to the Order. There we reunite with Schizo right when Ricky pulls up and by the red box on my bike realizes what we have done. Actual reason why Ricky drove here is because Addy was looking for Deacon. During the ride, Ricky explains that Iron Mike was already in negotiation with the Rippers and sharing the cargo from the plane. But Deacon mentions that there was barely anything left for Lost Lake, meaning that the Rippers oh, lied. Lady. What? Who could have known? This is an unforeseen move. We also learned about Deacon and Iron Mike's beef from the past. Apparently, Iron Mike would not pay for the survivors Deacon and Boozer would bring to Lost Lake, so he delivered them to Hot Springs instead, idea which Iron Mike hated because, well, I think it's pretty obvious why. William! William, if you can hear me, I need you to stop! Addy tells Deacon that there's no other option but to cut off Boozer's arm because his hand is the core of the problem. Deacon tries to come up with some sort of solution but in the end has no other option but to deal with the fact and help Addy do the amputation. No, 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 he's losing too much blood. You gotta stop. He's losing too much blood. Hand me the gun. Oh, no. Boozer, come on, man. Come on. Hold him. You're okay, pal. Where? Where do I hold him? Just hold him like this. Stop panicking. I'm and crying. In the end, Eddie says that Boozer will live, although he might not drive a bike anymore, which is kind of his whole life purpose. But the little moment of grief is interrupted by Iron Mike calling Deacon outside. Mike tells Deacon that Rippers followed him all the way to the border and saw him and Skizzle together, meaning that they know that Deacon is working with Lost Lake, which is a pretty big problem for the peace treaty, and instead of kicking Deacon out, Iron Mike reminds him that for his selfish act, he's not only paying with his own life, but also with the life of other people in the camp. Even Schizo tries to step up for Deacon by basically saying it is what it is. And so far, seems like Schizo is actually trying to help, even though it was his fault to begin with. Next thing on our to-do list is O'Brien's stalking mission, where we learn that the researchers are assuming that the virus is not in fact a natural occurring, but a planned infection that infects only the specific part known as lymph system, an important part of human body, specifically affecting the proto-octogenes, altering which can cause cancer. But instead of giving people cancer, this virus alters the octogenes in a way where we have mutated crackheads 
running around. The only thing you should take out of this dialogue is the last part, where the researcher says that the virus has a specific task, which is to enhance human genome, but something went wrong in the process. Later, Deacon tries to get some answers from O'Brien, but I feel like either Nero truly has no idea what's going on, or they were part of the problem and now are trying to hide it. Accepting a bounty mission from Ricky, who is our new job dealer, Deacon calls Addy to check on Boozer, but Boozer himself answers the call instead. Boozer is doing much better now, even cracking up some jokes about his lost arm. And this part is supposed to give us some kind of relief and joy that Boozer is still alive, but let's be real, we knew he's gonna be alive. Not only because his infection was not serious, like many reviewers who considered this to be a freaker virus, when in reality it was just a simple blood infection, which is relatively simple to cure, but also proves once more that Deacon physically cannot lose anyone or anything around him in the story and the emotions of helplessness and being powerless over the situation that we saw him go through while Boozer was hurt are pathetic. What's the point of showing a very impactful character development and making players get a feeling of sympathy for Deacon in the process, when couple hours later, Boozer is completely fine and walks away with just the loss of his hand. Obviously it's not just that, it's also the fact that Boozer's lifestyle is gonna change forever, as you might remember he's a 24-7 drifter and, well, without a hand you can't really drift, right? Ricky's mission is to kill someone named Red Riley, who is in the middle of clearing his camp from freaks. Something to point out here is that a lot of drifters are now wearing helmets, which is a big no-no for my crossbow. So instead, I used a 2000 AQ move and and used freaks to my advantage by luring a little horde to finish off the rest of the drifters. What really happened is I wanted to kill the drifters with a grenade, but that shit was too loud and caught an attention of a nearby freak, so I used the situation and ran away. In the end, I found Red Riley in the depths of his cabin, who was stupid enough to rush me with an axe, perfectly knowing that he is the main target. At the camp, Deacon decides to make it up to Iron Mike and has an idea of how to make the surrounding area safer. He takes Iron Mike to one of the caves up the mountains and briefly explains the whole Nero theory about freakers using caves to hibernate during the day and cooks up a plan to shut the cave up using some dynamite to reduce freak population. Okay, this guy earned some respect points for not snitching. Deacon later explains his knowledge of freaker hibernation spots from eavesdropping Nero staff, which at this point are as rare as a UFO. Iron Mike believes us and knows where we can get some dynamite, or at least where we can get the location of the Oregon mines that might have some dynamite. We pull up to the main gates, where Iron Mike is ready to take us to... Holy shit! Who let the old man slap a V8 on his bike? This bike might go fast, but definitely not far. On our way, Mike explains that caves in Oregon were well known for huge amounts of cinnabar, one of the main sources of mercury. In order to get it, you need to dig mines, and for mine expansion you need dynamite. However, to use the dynamite, you first need to register it with the local county in the old federal building and give the copies of the dynamite crate keys to the commissioner. The building is located in Sherman's camp, a place that we have visited before for a list and knife. Deacon mentions that Iron Mike promised to never set foot into Sherman's camp, and later on we learn the reason and Mike's story after the outbreak. <coughs> oh my god. What the hell, Mike? Two weeks in. The ammo was gone. Two sides called a truce. A meeting. Oh, we knew what was coming. We knew what was coming and we were prepared. fight didn't last long but, but it was bad this cutscene gives us a hint on why Iron Mike is trying so hard to keep the peace treaty with the Rippers. For a person who had to slaughter real sane people and see his own friends die in the process can leave a significant mark to the point where Mike wishes he wasn't the one to walk out of this alive. And this is where we see the true consequences of killing. These were not freaks who cannot think or turn back into humans. These are people who deliberately chose to kill each other because the resources were running low and instead of trying to fix the problem together, everyone went on the ramp page thinking only for themselves. This is a good scene where Deacon can learn that he's not the only person who lost someone close and one of many steps that Deacon will take to forget and move on. But instead, Deacon again complains that the only reason Iron Mike brought him here is because he's a big old bitch and is trying to convince Deacon that maybe Rippers deserve a chance as well, even if they're already past saving. 
which is actually another good point. Picking up the map from the safe, Iron Mike hears bike engines roaring outside, which means only one thing. Now, because drifters are idiots, they make as much noise as possible because freaks are friendly pacifists and kind mutants that definitely don't want to tear you apart. Because I am so awesome and cool, we successfully escape Sherman's camp and head back home. Before separating, Iron Mike gives us more insight on his thoughts that even if Carlos, the leader of the Rippers, comes for him, he will stand his side on the peace treaty and won't attack until the other party breaks it. In the infirmary, we visit Boozer, who seems to be doing well, making more jokes about the loss of his hand. How's it going, brother? No, oh, Deke. I don't know about you, but, uh, I could use a hand. <laughs> I still have no idea if these jokes are genuine or he's slowly losing it, but let's just assume he's fine. Addy dick rides Deacon for the fifth time in the game, how insanely lucky she is because Deacon found the antibiotics and not only Boozer will be okay, but also Eddie and Mia, names and people we have absolutely no knowledge of, so why would I care? All that matters now is Boozer is alive. Why? Well. There was a reason, but the rear feed of the printer ate it. Following the scripted events, Deacon follows another helicopter for O'Brien. In this one, we learn that Nero has no clue why freaks are building their nests, and also that they're not scanning and researching all the zones in the area because some of them contain Tucker's camp. The real name of Tucker's camp was Salome Hot Springs, the name which triggers researcher to quote some random ass poem for no reason. Similar to how once you mentioned the 90s, some 12 year old kid is gonna scream <laughs> We get a call from Boozer, who is now more self-aware about his jokes. I guess it's his way of getting through the loss of his hand and not being able to ride his bike anymore. And apparently, Boozer was already sent on farming duty. It's like I can still feel my right hand, you know? I think they call that phantom pain. Returning to the camp, we instantly meet up with Schizo. You see, Deacon was dodging Schizo's jobs because after having a scene with Iron Mike about the stalling antibiotics, Deacon doesn't trust Schizo anymore and asked Iron Mike to work with Ricky instead. Now Schizo pulls up with yet another job, by jokes on him, we got a job with Ricky. Seriously, where are we headed? North. Ricky, I don't have time for your crap any more than Schizo's. I'll do whatever it takes. Wow, he already forgot. What a dumbass. Does he have dementia? Nah, he's just retarded. Ricky says that they should power up the infirmary's respirator by fixing the hydro dam, which should be generating electricity, but it doesn't. Deacon provides an argument that if you own life support nowadays, you're pretty much dead, to which Ricky brings a very solid counter argument. What if it had been Boozer? If it was Boozer, Deacon would snap his fingers and spawn a nuclear power plant outside of Lost Lake. The reason why specifically Deacon should help is because he lived up north and knows the area more than anyone else. Also, we don't really have a choice. We get on our bikes, which means another drive, during which we learn that Ricky escaped from Portland to Farewell and was actually drifting together with Deacon and Boozer for some time. She also asks Deacon about his and Iron Mike's little field trip, to which Deacon only mentions the map with TNT locations. Since Ricky Ricky is a water turbine expert, she gives her amazing expertise on the situation. That shit ain't working. But to make sure it doesn't work, she and Deacon touch the generator door just to realize it's not vibrating, meaning that it's off. In order to start the turbine again, Ricky volunteers to jump into the river and clear out the dam. Meanwhile, Deacon will go to the generator door and check for vibrations, which happens instantly as we can now hear the generator working. But that's only part of the problem, because there is still no power. Creeper. On our way to the Transformer, we learned that Ricky has a dad and a brother. Well, had, because after the evacuation, she never heard of them again. As well, Ricky tells us why she doesn't like Schizo. A few months back, Eddie and I caught him hiding outside our cabin while we were bathing. What? God, he's a peeping Tom. I told him if it happened again, he'd find out that my gun is bigger than his. What do you mean by that? We fixed the Transformers, which are full of infected nests, so you already know, Molotov goes. And boom, now we got power. Right before leaving, Ricky stops Deacon and asks him about the photo that Deacon stared at all the time while they were drifting together. The photo, as you might have guessed, is the portrait of Sarah. And here's where Ricky tells us the real reason why she stopped drifting with Deacon and Boozer. Not because she knew she had no chance with him, but also because he doesn't want to move on and settle in one of the camps. That's why he's drifting back and forth completely denying people trying to help him. Ricky doesn't want to end up like Deacon and desires to move forward because she knows there's nothing that will bring her loved ones back, which is another small mental step that Deacon has to take to finally settle down and let Sarah go, just like Mike said, just like Boozer said, just like everyone kept telling him. But boohoo, the moment is ruined because THE RIPPERS! But these are... 
different. Not for us as a player, of course, because it's pretty much the same bow trap to shoot down, but for Ricky and Deacon, who mentioned that Rippers amped up on something, like PCP or Bath Soul. Deacon and Ricky start to question why Rippers attack them when Ricky pulls a wanted poster for Mongrels from Farewell Original, and at the back there is a rough drawing of Deacon's MC logo. Seems like Carlos put a bounty on both Deacon and Boozer, still neither us or Deacon having an idea why. On the drive back, Ricky asks how Deacon ended up in the MC, or the motorcycle club, to which Deacon explains that before the mongrels he was an army soldier. His team was advancing towards Mazar-e-Sharif when the group of Taliban's attacked them while Deacon and his team were transporting military guns on a flatbed carried by a Humvee. The Taliban flipped the car over and Humvee fell into the river. Deacon had to dive multiple times to rescue his comrades, but unfortunately none of them survived the crash. This was a break point for Deacon, after which he left the army and coming back home had no idea what to do next. So, he bought a bike and started his ride around the country for a couple weeks until he settled at Farewell working at a bike store run by the man named Jack, who is also the leader of the Mongrels club. Jack patched Deacon into the club himself and he became part of the Mongrels. Boozer did mention Jack earlier in the game, but it's hard to build up what type of person Jack was except that he went to prison to keep his club's name respected. While driving towards the camp, Deacon and Ricky notice a blown up transformer on the power line, so the job is not done. Thankfully, Deacon decides to fix it up in the morning. Before returning to Lost Lake, Ricky decides to show us an old sawmill where we find out that freaks use not only caves to hibernate, but generally any dark areas, in this case, an old barn. So yeah, this is kind of a problem because it means that caves are not the only hibernating spots and sealing them up would not reduce the freak population by a lot, and most of the job has to be done by hand. But that will become a problem closer to endgame. Returning to the camp, Addie runs up to Ricky, who is wondering where the hell she has been all day. For some reason, Ricky doesn't say the exact reason why, which causes even more problems that Ricky is trying to brush off. <laughs> Women. <laughs> Pretty clear there is a tension happening in the relationship, even though we have never seen them argue before. Maybe Addie is jealous, but again, that is yet another question for us to figure out. Hopefully. We get a call from O'Brien telling us yet another LZ to eavesdrop a Neuro Researcher. On this Neuro field trip, Researcher is noting that the Freaker is wearing an almost new golden watch as well as less torn clothing. This leads to a conclusion that either the Freak just found the golden watch or has been taking care of it for the past two years. There's also another theory from me that was not mentioned by the Researcher that the virus is still spreading. The two theories of a Researcher combined into one theory that the stage 2 infection Freaks have a vestigial memory. Memory. Essentially, they have small bits of information or memory left in their brain and their subconsciousness or muscle memory is, you know, replaying them. Which leads to the guard asking a question similar to the NPC in the camp, if the infected still remember their past and if they're aware of what is happening. To which the researcher answers with CT scan tests proving that they're completely brain dead. We contact O'Brien once more to tell him that the job is done, to which he only asks if the researcher was male or female and then hangs up. Great. Meeting Boozer, we notice that he is a little bit depressed about losing his arm and not being able to hunt or drive his bike again. So guess what Deacon decides to do? I thought I'd maybe head to O'Leary Mountain and get his bike. Great, next you should rev the bike in front of him and flex that you can and he can't. But before that... Um, guys? Is this Freddy Fazbear? Arr, 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 arr. Oh, yes! Yeah! I fought the bear again. This one was a little bit tougher than the last one. I did try use the crossbow to beat him in the process of receiving bear combos that I still have no idea how Deacon survived, after which I decided to use the power of freedom. This was the first look at an animal affected by the virus, which I haven't seen until now. Retrieving the bike back to its owner, we can definitely see Boozer's depression boosting up even more after realizing the bike throttle is on the right side and the idea of using it for spare parts wasn't any better. But anyways, with this mission, we completely finalized Boozer's He's My Brother story arc. Completing a storyline rewards you with a spray paint pattern on your bike. After the mechanic, I went on a side quest hiatus because I really wanted to get the level 2 trust so I can upgrade my gas tank and durability. Since I pretty much burned all the nests around, the only thing that was missing were the bounties and ambush camps. Since Ricky had only ambush camp missions, I took whatever she had. It didn't give me much, but it is what it is. Coming back to the camp, we meet up with Addy, who tells Deacon that he should do something about Boozer because the loss of his arm is a 
a huge change in his life, especially since he's a full-time drifter. Deacon is not very sentimental and understanding person, as you might have noticed by the recent gift to Boozer, so Addy pushes him to try and cheer Boozer up. Deacon doesn't believe Addy, for some reason, and goes to check up on Boozer at the farm near Sherman's camp, where we get the best dialogue in the entire history of gaming. Hey Boozer, how's it going? I got work to do. <clears throat> Alright, don't work too hard. This piece of dialogue would be praised for years to come. The three sentences perfectly describes the strong brotherhood between the two bikers that it should and would be studied by the English literature students so they can finally use their PhD for something better than serving sandwiches at Subway. From the most depressing I got work to do, Deacon finally realizes that his brother is not doing so well. He contacts Addy to confirm her theory and will make sure to keep an eye on Boozer from now on, which is a lie because later on Boozer almost ends his life. At the camp we visit Iron Mike who is already planning our first visit to the mines for TNT hunt with Schizo. Schizo Schizo doesn't want to go to that particular cave because he lost men there while going on a supply run. Deacon offers to go by himself, but Schizo still doesn't trust Deacon, so Iron Mike forces the two to go together. Finding the keys to the crates with TNT, we proceed to enter the mines themselves. Walking through the tunnels, which is probably the most boring part of the game, we find the two men Schizo mentioned, Taurus and Evans. The couple were stuck here for a week, and as Taurus survived the longest, he had no other option but to turn to cannibalism. I have no idea how they got stuck here because the exit was like 20 steps away, so they had a good chance of escape. Schizo burns down the bodies in respect to the dead, which shows that he still has compassion and is not a total dick. The first crate we find it turns out to be empty, which means that all the explosives were stored in other place somewhere else in the mines. To summarize it all up, they walk around, they meet with newts, they fight them, they fight more freaks, find the keys and get the TNT. Before the TNT though, Schizo brings up the rippers and the already known fact that they're looking for two mongrels. Deacon ignores it again saying that if Carlos needs Boozer and Deacon so much, he can go suck his own dick. Which raises the same old question. Man! What did he do to make them Reapers. that mad? At the bikes, Schizo drops his insane plan to wait until Iron Mike has a fatal accident and offers to take over the leadership together. To which Deacon bursts out laughing and drops his philosophy on Schizo. We all do things to survive, Schizo. I get that. You remember how I said there's some lines I ain't crossed? Stabbing a friend in the back, that's one of them. Deacon contacts Iron Mike about Schizo's plan to overthrow him, but Iron Mike already knows about his plan and can take care of himself. If you don't trust Schizo, why would you keep him as a head of security then? Deke, like I said, Schizo's got his issues, but it... <sighs> it, it's not like we don't got ours. God damn it, it's like if Schizo was a content creator making Minecraft videos on his channel back in the days and Iron Mike knew about it and sent him to take care of Kindergarten. Right at the Lost Lake entrance, I saw a survivor. After making John Wick level move on the camping sniper, I got a chance to choose which camp to send the survivor to, even though Lost Lake is literally right there. Since I need street cred, I sent him to Lost Lake, to which survivor excitedly ran to the wrong direction before disappearing into thin air. Is this like a hint that Deacon might have schizophrenia? At the camp, Deacon wonders where Boozer is because he was supposed to be back from the camp. Schizo, who is also in charge of the farm, has no idea except that he grabbed the whiskey bottle and said, I'm going home. Obviously that concerns Deacon because what the fuck is home mean? After some more hints from Boozer on his current location, we meet him on the road, completely broken and drunk. Boozer is planning to give himself up to the freaks when Deacon says that if he wants to die, that they will die together. This unexpected move sobers Boozer up when Deacon reminds him about the time when Boozer's wife died. Boozer, similarly to this situation, also decided to drink himself to death, but Deacon pulled up and saved him by drinking the rest of the whiskey bottle. He has a moment of clarity, realizing that Deacon is not playing around, and right as the horde in front of them notices the two, he decides to return to Lost Lake. Back at the camp, Deacon really takes Boozer's depression seriously and asks Ricky to make him a prosthetic blade for his arm. During the conversation, Deacon helps Ricky stand up, which gets some motor oil on his hand. I mention this because seems like Deacon got a very quick flashback to the same thing happening with Sarah. I don't know if this is some type of hidden deep message in the game, but again, I'm not a critic and as I remember the director is not Darman. But fuck that because ya boy finally ranked up some street cred which means it's time to max out your bike. I noticed that while talking to some NPCs their mood and attitude change towards you once the camp rank is increased which is a pretty cool attention to details. Hey I'm just taking a look. Uh check back later I guess. 
Deacon St. John, how have you been? Buzz, how you doing? I'll be here if you need me. See you around. It's also snowing now and Deacon will be completely in snow after a couple minutes being outside. Okay. Alright, okay. Ricky out. What the fuck? What the hell? Completing Ricky's side mission, she sends us a shopping list for Boozer's knife, which are located across the state. We bring all the materials, after which Ricky says that she needs some time. I thought she really needed some time to build it, so I drove off to do some side quests, just so the bitch can contact me again, saying, oh, the knife is done. I swear to God with this game. Okay. Hey, brother. Look what oh. Ricky did. What? Made me a new toy. Oh, it was all Deacon. Oh, that's he really, really cool, Boozer. Hey, uh, I could have been one of those, those yeah. three goddamn musketeers. Hung oh, guard, you fucking <laughs> ripper. <laughs> Pretty oh, hey. Jesus. Oh. Come on. Whoa, whoa. Oh. As you may see, Boozer is more than happy with his new toy. In the meantime, we finally get some plot progression, meaning O'Brien is on the line. O'Brien says he needs us for one last job, which gets Deacon frustrated because so far, O'Brien delivered absolutely nothing from his side of the deal. To prove he's not slacking off, O'Brien tells Deacon Sarah's second name, Irene, which Deacon's reaction confirms as being true and he agrees to do the job. Before heading to the last Nero LZ, Deacon decides to drag Boozer with him to get some fresh air outside the camp. Boozer agrees and both of them drive off to the location. This LZ is much more serious than the other ones because this is where we learned that researchers found something in the freaker shit, something that will affect the future of mankind. So remember how I told you that freakers normally eat humans and if there are no humans they would eat themselves? Well, now we find out that freakers can also consume things like vegetables and berries, which means that their stomach can also process other food besides meat and flesh. But the fact that they eat it means that when the human population lowers, freakers will just switch their food cycle and eat plants and berries. Yo. Shit. Gotta stop doing that. What you got? Alright, look. I'm gonna lay it out for you, but it's not good news. I finally found a guy who was willing to do some digging through some files that we, they, they used to keep while they still kept records. Okay, no problem. Anyway, Sarah Whitaker, your wife, was admitted to the Camp Mash unit on the South Flats outside of Silver Lake. Uh, according to the records, she was in surgery for six hours and then was moved okay, to... So she survived. The stab wound, she survived. Yeah, yeah. According to the records, she made a full recovery. And then she was moved to another camp on the outskirts okay, of the Okay, so... So she could still be alive. Even after all this time, she could still be alive, you're saying? No. What do you mean, no? It was overrun. Everything was overrun. There were no survivors. Deacon's last bit of hope has finally snapped and he has to face the hard reality that Sarah is gone and nothing can bring her back. All those days we played as Deacon, everyone kept telling him that it's time to move on, even his best friend and brother. But deep inside, he was hoping to find her. And once he heard about O'Brien for the first time, that hope deep inside started to grow and forced Deacon to risk his life for at least some type of hint just for O'Brien to deliver the news that Deacon perfectly knew are true but his stubborn attitude never let him stop the search. This is a pretty big step that Deacon will take in the story. A step that will start up the moving on arc and calm Deacon's heart for real this time. Deacon returns back to the bike to find Boozer absent. Fuck! Following the trail of dead rippers, he finds him in the convenience store kneeling over an injured dog. Deacon notices how much Boozer cares about the dog but unfortunately it's badly injured and he has no other option but to take it down. We come back to the bike and Boozer asks Deacon what O'Brien said. Deacon doesn't tell him which causes the two to have a 1v1 which Boozer wins by pulling the most devious left hook that knocks Deacon on the floor. Eventually Deacon does tell Boozer about Sarah's death which doesn't surprise him because that's the exact thing he kept telling Deacon all those years. Think, Mark. Deacon drives back to the farm to let Boozer go, which is honestly kind of depressing to see, and returns back to the camp. After the confirmation of Sarah's death, Deacon decides to take the next step in his character progression arc and visit the church that the two married in. Killing off the ambush drifters, Deacon gets a flashback of their wedding. In the church, we see Sarah and Deacon ready to get married. From the conversation, we learn that people from both sides were not too fond of the relationship, so no one showed up, apart from Boozer, of course. Sarah gives her part of the speech and puts the ring on Deacon's finger when all of a sudden, drifters! So yeah, exactly 45 seconds later, we get dropped back into the cutscene. Whoever thought it's a good idea to put a drifter fight in the middle of a cutscene? 
why? Deacon says his part, which is pretty short because Deacon is not as creative and puts the ring on. So yeah, kissy kissy, blah blah blah, they're now officially married. Deacon comes back to reality and burns the church down, therefore taking a much more significant step in his character development arc and hopefully moving on with his life. Deacon and Ricky go and fix the generator and return to the camp to trigger Iron Mike's motivational speech. In it, he uses his amazing moment to note how important trust is and believing in people wanting to change for the better. And we can see this progression throughout our camp visits. Not many people respected Deacon at first, seeing him as just another burden that Iron Mike led in the camp. But by helping Lost Lake and climbing the trust ranks, Deacon proved to those same people who neglected him that he is better than they think and Iron Mike brings him as an example. Ricky notices a wound bleeding on Deacon's body and leads him to the infirmary. Addie is absent so Ricky takes it upon herself to stitch up the wound. And this is where we get the most weird moment in the game, the one that can easily compete with Scarlett's happy birthday song. The MC or after? I, uh, I don't remember. What about this one? Ricky, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, well, I heard that Addie doesn't really like, um, people messing around in her business. Yeah, I, I heard that too. What about this one? <sighs> Dick, I'm not married. Holy shit, she's switching sides! Thank God Deacon doesn't make a move, possibly because Addy saved Boozer's life and he takes his no backstabbing friends rule very seriously so nothing happened. While this was happening, we get a short view on Schizo peeping through the window. This will never come out anywhere, it's just, it's just a thing, you know, he peeked. Damn it. Before Deacon leaves, Ricky suggests to stop and light a candle, which means that Deacon should stop being a bitch and finally settle down in a camp and live off the rest of his life. Or he has to kill someone, well, I don't know. Next day, Deacon goes to Addy and cries about Boozer's depression again, requesting some antidepressant or something like that. Addy then tells him that she heard about the dog incident. How did she hear about the dog incident? From who? And thinks that Boozer might use a little puppy around him to heal his heart. He needs something to heal his soul. I got it. Give this dude weed. So we head out to find Boozer a puppy. Reaching the place mentioned by Addy's patient, I decided to refuel but got ambushed by the drifters. To my surprise, the drifter managed to punch me out of the animation, which made me realize that Deacon using the gas pump is not a cutscene but is happening in real time. Then why is there a cutaway every time I refuel my bike? What type of second fourth wall breaking is that? Reaching the marked camp, Deacon finds a little gray puppy hidden inside the bathroom cabin. He lures the puppy out with a piece of meat and picks him up to drive back to Boozer. Upon gifting the puppy, Boozer is more than happy to see a little furball jump onto him and instantly takes him back to the house with no questions. I'm still pretty sure that's a wolf puppy but we won't find out until he grows up. Right afterwards we get a call from Schizo who wants to meet up at the back of the lodge. Schizo heard Deacon's idea to seal the caves and wants to help. The only problem is Iron Mike wasn't able to find the dead quartz to detonate the early found TNT. But Schizo apparently has an idea where they can get some. But of course when it comes to Schizo there's always a catch. The location is on the Ripper's territory, which makes Deacon completely deny Schizo's idea as his plan might provoke a war between the two parties. But Schizo said it won't be a problem since he found a hidden path that would get us there unnoticed after which Deacon agrees to cooperate. Reaching the mentioned path, Schizo suggests to go on foot so Reapers won't see us or hear us even though Schizo never mentioned that part before. It already feels like Schizo is not mentioning something but it's already too late to turn back. Crossing the hill to the Ripper territory, you can see them dancing in front of a bonfire doing some type of ritual by cutting themselves with knives and machetes. Sneaking up to the campfire, Schizo explains that the Rippers are not feeling any pain thanks to some sort of drug that completely numbs their nerves. At the crosswalk, Deacon mentions that he used to drive around these parts and is sure that the transportation complex, the place that they're going to, is located on the other side, but Schizo reassures him and we keep following his lead. At the location, Schizo and Deacon pry open the facility where Deacon gets jump scared by one of the newts and drops the door. He volunteers to go in first to hold the door for Schizo from the inside, but the door is too heavy so Schizo drops it and it gets jammed. So now Deacon has to fight off a horde of newts by himself. Soon after defeating the newts we find the necessary device and Schizo breaks down that he now trusts Deacon thanks to all the shit they went through. And right before leaving the storage unit, Schizo turns his gun on Deacon and knocks him out before he can react. <laughs> Hey, 
pain. Do you know who I am? No. My followers have all given up their names. Except for me. For now. Uh-huh. Carlos. <laughs> yes! Oh, you're the guy! Wait, what? Jesse. What the fuck is Jesse? I shit you not, I've looked through all my video footage again, thinking maybe I have missed some sort of clue about Jesse. But I found absolutely nothing on Jesse. Not a conversation, not a note, not a single dialogue. Never was Jesse mentioned. Throughout the entire game, I thought that there will be a huge revelation that the leader of the Rippers is actually Jack, the supposedly dead leader of the Mongrels. Jack was mentioned quite a bit in the conversations, and the game was, at least bit by bit, building his character for a possible huge crossover once we finally find out who Carlos truly is. And it all was working so far. Both Deacon and Boozer talked about him, he was part of the Mongrel Motorcycle Club, which means that he's the only one who knew that the two guys are in fact from his club and was sending rippers after them and then the game would explain why but like who the fuck is Jesse? Some random dude. We later find out from Jesse's monologue that Boozer and another Mongrel named Jersey Jim held him down while Jack burned off the tattoos on his back. But why? You know maybe he beat up someone at the club, maybe he stole something from the club or maybe he killed someone but we don't know. And I'm not gonna guess. I know this shit is ass when out of the two people playing this game, only the protagonist is surprised. It's like if Joker would have taken off Batman's mask thinking that it's Bruce Wayne, but it turned out to be his janitor from high school who won a lottery and decided to bring justice to Gotham. Jesse talks for a little bit more, burning Deacon's tattoos in the process, then knocks him out and leaves the room. Next thing we see is Deacon trying to get out, but someone walks in and that someone is... Holy shit, it's Lisa! You see? That's a surprise! Who the fuck is Jesse? After freeing Deacon's hands, she explains that the reason why Rippers want to be like freaks is because they don't remember what or who they lost, being free from the past and are just existing with no regrets. Which explains the message we found earlier in the game. She then leaves the knife to Deacon and disappears. After processing what the fuck just happened, Deacon picks up the knife and frees himself, starting a stealth sequence. Sneaking past the Rippers in the house, we get outside and witness an amazing view of Rippers enjoying their snorted substances to the fullest. Carlos took away all our gear, so we have to find it around the camp piece by piece. The first thing we find is our items, which is observed by a ripper so drugged out he sees our cap as a holy grail of Venus. Knocking the shit out of him, Deacon gears up, sarcastically asking the ripper why they kidnap civilians, but the guy's so out of his head, he's calculating how much molecules there are per square ice cream cone. Deacon notices that his cut is missing, so he asks the ripper about it. The guy comes back to earth and says that some guy took it. We retrieve the cut and outside we see another ripper drag Lisa inside the house so Deacon decides to save her as a payback for saving him. We then again try to drag Lisa into the camp which she declines to which Deacon is completely done with her sorry ass and lets her out on her own. Sneaking back to the bike we notice that a lot of rippers are now driving towards the camp. We contact Ricky who says that the rippers are already at Lost Lake and are looking for Boozer. Driving back Lost Lake camp is completely in flames with civilians getting slaughtered by the rippers. I really didn't feel like fighting anything at all since I had limited ammo after my shit got stolen and there are rippers with LMGs so I squeezed my way through the battlefield. Eventually we reach the infirmary where Addy is held hostage by one of the rippers but then they hear the blowhorn which makes the rippers stand back. Deacon asks the survivor to find out what's going on to which he replies that Iron Mike is negotiating a ceasefire with Carlos. So now we head back to the lodge to check the situation. Damn it, Skizzle, why don't you tell him or I'm gonna cut your throat. <laughs> okay. Okay! I made a deal with Carlos, okay? Mike, but it wasn't. It wasn't to sell out the camp, I swear. It was just them, the two of them, him and Boozer. That's all that he wants, just them. I did it to save the camp, Mike. I did it to fix shit, to restore the treaty he broke. 
Iron Mike states that Schizo's deal is off and the only thing that stays strong is their peace treaty. He then gives Schizo his well-deserved smack into the face but stops Boozer and Deacon from ripping him apart, saying that he will go into a lockup because that's how things are in the camp. Before leaving, Deacon stops Jesse and tells him this isn't over, to which Jesse looks at Deacon's completely burned hand and walks off. I will spoil it right away so we don't start another sub-story that we would never finish. Nothing happens to his hand and nothing happens to Deacon. Unlike Boozer, Deacon is completely completely immune to the blood infection and a couple of bandages on his hand will solve the problem. On the balcony, Deacon and Boozer are pissed at Jesse and unlike Iron Mike, they plan to do something about it. Deacon instructs Boozer to wait at the gates and grabs TNT with a dead cord, picking up Schizo's sniper rifle on the way. Then we visit Addy to patch the arm, but yeah, doesn't, it's not important. On our way, we get confronted by Ricky, who notices the stolen TNT. Deacon then narrates his amazing backstory of how his dad used to drown rats while they were asleep, which helps Ricky connect the dots and figure out that Deacon wants to blow up the water reservoir above Carlos's camp to drown the Rippers. As a last a chance to argue with Deacon, Ricky says, but what would Mike say? To which Deacon replies with yet another womp womp and leaves with Boozer to the dam. The place is packed with Rippers, so Boozer offers to plant the explosives while Deacon is covering him with the rifle. The mission is successful and the whole construction goes down with a blast, destroying and killing everything on its way. But the job is not done yet, because one problem is still breathing. Killing what's left of the Rippers, Deacon finds Carlos on the second floor and the stairs are broken, which means Boozer cannot join him. Boozer gives his motivational speech and sends Deacon to the battle. On the arena, Carlos catches Deacon off guard and feeds him angel dust, which causes Deacon to start tripping out and we start our boss fight. Since Carlos snorted 5 times of what he gave Deacon, he is a little bit more hyped up, while Deacon is more of a one bottle of whiskey kind of state, which does not affect our combat skills that much. The fight is underwhelming, I can't even say much about it. Yeah, it might be exciting for Deacon, since he knows why Jesse is a bad person, but for the player, he's as evil as any other rippers we fought. Killing Jesse, Deacon has his little shock episode again and then leaves to the house with Boozer. Over at Lost Lake, Deacon tells Iron Mike that he didn't have a choice, but Mike tells him he did, everyone does. Deacon counters that by saying it's either us or them, to which Iron Mike replies that it's always us or them, and the problem is that many people in this world cannot figure out that us is all the people that are left alive, all the people that survived the outbreak and now trying to fight off the freaks and rebuild back the society. Whether it's rippers or drifters or civilians, every life counts. To which Deacon drops a reality check on Mike saying that outside everyone does anything from stealing to murdering just to see another day. And this is where we get the two point of views on the current world. Yeah, sure, every life matters, but out of desperation people can do things that go beyond any morality, especially during times when you can get eaten alive by making the wrong move or killed in cold blood by a stranger because you have more food than them. And if you don't do the same, you will end up dead. But Iron Mike is right about one thing, giving a chance to the right people is important or we will never be able to rebuild what we lost to the freaks. Before Deacon leaves, Iron Mike lets him know that he cut Schizo loose in exchange for never coming back to Lost Lake because he knows Schizo would never escape the trial alive. At the same time, he believes that hanging Schizo as punishment would be too easy, but throwing him outside with burden and sorrow of backstabbing the only person that trusted him is way more painful. At the main gates, Deacon sees Ricky trying to teach Addy how to ride a bike, which kicks him into another flashback with Sarah. Deacon drives up to pick up Sarah from work, but the guard stops him immediately because Deacon doesn't have the required level clearance. Deacon, being Deacon, starts to square up right when Sarah drives to the gates and stops the guard. Then we ride off, this time Sarah controlling the bike with Deacon teaching her in the process. But right when they reach the turn, the couple has another near-death experience, but this time Sarah is the one who saves the day. Dude, what's up with Americans and driving on the opposite lane all the time? When Sarah finally comes down from her panic attack, Deacon flexes with his new patch, Nomad, telling Sarah that he is partially left the club to spend more time with her. Then we get another yapping sequence until we see a police car driving to the research lab. Sarah has to leave us for an urgent call but convinces Deacon that it's nothing serious and leaves to the lab.
We come back to reality where the gay couple are having relationship problems again. This is where Deacon has a post-flashback clarity and contacts O'Brien. Earlier, O'Brien mentioned that Nero choppers took people that either worked with Nero or had a government clearance. All of a sudden, Deacon just remembers that Sarah did have some sort of FBI clearance since she worked for a bioengineering lab. O'Brien promises to look into it and leaves the frequency. Let's get off the story for a bit and talk about some shit I did off script. After the cutscene, I decided to grind for some cash. First thing on the list was a bounty mission given by Ricky. On my way there, I have stumbled on some drifters fighting a group of freaks. While I was debating whose side to take, a horde of freaks appeared which quickly unlocked the third option. The marked man was wearing a helmet and had a gun, which makes him smarter than the last guy but didn't help him much. Before collecting bounty credits, I invested into a new gun, which turned out to be a shotgun. Then I took my bike to the paint job in the process finding out that the bike is actually right behind Deacon and discovering the custom paint jobs that he earned by completing storylines. While scrolling, I noticed a sick reference that didn't catch my attention at first until I read the title, Death Stranding. To say the least, this is a very cool reference since the two games are pretty similar in terms of traveling around a dead world and helping people. Next on my to-do list was a Nero checkpoint, which kind of bugged out for me at first. I got there during the night, which shouldn't be a problem for unlocking checkpoints, but I have never seen such a bug before. Let's start off with a pretty obvious one. The generator is missing. I ran around the facility four times and couldn't find it. Later, thanks to the internet, I realized that this stone right here is supposed to have a generator next to it. What confused me even more is the Nero labs themselves were open and I could enter, loot them and even use the bed, but the Nero injector and the audio recorder were not present. I left to check out another location and coming back to the same Nero checkpoint again, everything was working as intended. Since I am very lazy, I fast traveled to one of the destroyed ambush camps where I heard a bear having a fight with some. Something. I didn't pay much attention to that until in the quarter of my screen I saw the poor bear flying. Now I'm not gonna lie. I got shit scared, thinking what could possibly be strong enough to send a 400 pound bear to test out gravity. To my relief, the bear was fighting wolves and that was just a bug in the game. You know. Fuck the bear, I ain't taking that motherfucker down. I also went off screen to visit Sarah's memorial because it's completely pointless to listen Deacon retell all the shit we went through. So, yeah. Deacon drives to O'Brien's meet and greet where he shows us Sarah's badge. O'Brien explains that Sarah did in fact have federal clearance level 4 and she was transported with a Recon unit east of Fort Rock. But unfortunately, the camp was taken down as well, this time by the militia because their main base is nearby. Deacon asks O'Brien to take him there, but he can't as the same militia base has a lot of firepower, so it's a no-fly zone. He does, however, mention that the base is somewhere around Crater Lake. Before leaving, O'Brien shares that Nero is studying freaks because they are evolving, which they think means the situation will get much worse from now. Deacon excitedly contacts Boozer, telling him about the badge and needs to figure out a path that leads to Crater Lake. Boozer says that Iron Mike might know since they drove with him a year prior, but he ain't happy with the two for obvious reasons. Deacon, as always, doesn't give much of a shit and says he'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, definitely not, and I'm very curious how this moon-sized curveball is gonna land. At the camp, Deacon visits Iron Mike, who is not happy to see him and won't show the alternative passage to Crater Lake. But Deacon is smart about it and pushes on Iron Mike's feelings, which works. He agrees to show the path, but under one condition, Deacon cannot come back to the camp. Since Deacon is pretty desperate, he has no other option but to agree on the offer. After giving up his leather jacket, possibly forcing a very small tear out of the player, he hugs Boozer goodbye and both him and Iron Mike start their ride. On the way, Iron Mike mentions that he took Jack fishing once, the same Jack from Mongrills and says that he ran a pretty tight club, which also means that Deacon and Mike did have somewhat of a history before the outbreak. I cannot miss out on mentioning how fucking slow Mike was driving. Maybe it's supposed to be like a less sad moment that we're leaving the camp forever now. I'm not sad. I've spent the last 12 hours in the same location, I got enough enjoyment for me to finally move on. Unlike some people. Before leaving, Iron Mike asks Deacon if this even matters and even if she's still alive, everyone else is dead. Which is one last push for Deacon to admit with Sarah being gone and finally move on. Which he technically already did, but the developers are still pushing the story forward, having no idea what to properly do. Because technically, the story is already done, but they still want to get those extra 6 hours of gameplay. Like, Jesus Christ, man.